I was born in Seattle, Washington, actually a little bit south of it in a city called Renton. I was an only child growing up. I spent every spare minute I had out in the trails, riding motocross and mountain biking. My father served just right at the tail end of Vietnam. He was in Special Forces about eight years. When I decided to enlist, my parents were, they were proud of me. You know, they were proud I, I chose to go the route I did. I got to the unit in August of 2006, and the majority of the training period was focused for Iraq. It wasn't until our last training exercise when they came in, it's like, hey, mission change, we're going to Afghanistan now. Especially back in 2007, it's a pretty hot zone up there in Nuristan province. I remember getting off the helicopter and I asked where the base was and they just pointed up. I was not expecting that. When Sergeant Kyle White deployed to Afghanistan in the spring of 2007, he was stationed at Ranch House in the mountains overlooking the village of Oranis. In August, the base came under a coordinated attack. With 50% of the command outpost under enemy control, the platoon leader, Captain Matthew Ferrara, called in an airstrike on their own position, breaking the enemy's will. On that day, there was 11 wounded, but there was no U.S. casualties. We had suspected some of the people in Ranis were either aiding Taliban in the area or were members themselves. They sent a representative requesting that we attend a Shura meeting there with the village elders. We left Cop Bella with 14 U.S. personnel and then about 10 Afghan National Army members. We took the high trail throughout the night, set up security. On normal Shura meetings, there's usually a couple village elders, but on this day, it seemed every male fighting agent above was gathered around us, very involved in the conversation. But as the meeting grew on, repetitive questions, stuff that's not really relevant, started to get brought up. And then it started to feel like, hey, they're, they're trying to hold us here, something's not right. Our Marine ETT, the embedded training team member, Sergeant Box, came up with his interpreter. And he said, we need to go, this is bad. And so we wrapped up the meeting and then made our way on the low trail. As the radio telephone operator, Kyle White was in the middle of the patrol with Captain Ferrara and Sergeant Box and his good friend Kane Schilling as forward observer. The entire platoon was on high alert, anticipating an ambush. I heard a single shot, then two shots, and then it was just fully automatic fire and RPGs slamming into the hillside right next to us. I remember picking an area on the hillside and then just dumping my first magazine, all 30, as quick as I could. Going for another magazine, I dropped my first one, I slapped it in, and as soon as I did that, it was lights out. And I remember being face down on a rock and was, I just picked my face up no more than probably just a couple inches off the rock and uh, a round hit that rock and kind of fragmented in the left side of my face. And I remember that brought me back to reality pretty quick. Right after that, I hear Kane let out a yell behind me and I roll over and he's running down the trail dragging his right arm. Hey, that's my buddy and he needs help. So I go over to him and he's got a wound kind of in his upper right shoulder. It was bleeding pretty profusely. So I put a tourniquet on, tightened it down and kind of went about you know, returning fire. Captain Ferrara was probably 30 feet from where Kane Schilling and myself were. And I could see his helmet in his bag, but I couldn't see him. I finally put two and two together that he was laying there. I low crawled to him, checked his pulse, and he was, uh, he'd already been killed. Kane was like, hey, box is hit. And then so I look over to my left up the trail and his movements weren't coordinated and he wasn't making any progress. So. I decided, well, screw it, I'm gonna go get him. There was bullets landing all around me. If he got hit one more time, he definitely wasn't gonna make it. So I drug him a few feet. They would shoot at me all the way. I'd wait for the fire to kind of die down, run back out, drag him some more, and I repeated that a couple times until I got him back to our area. Worked on him, tried to do everything I could until um, he died there. I remember looking up back at Kane and the bullet went right through his left knee. I didn't have any tourniquets left. I pulled my belt off, looped it around his leg, told him it was gonna hurt, and he said to just do it. 
As the last remaining battle-ready soldier on the mountainside, White turned his attention to holding the position and calling in air support. That was my fight. It was keeping the enemy at their location, keeping their heads down. But I was just the one that was there that day. I know if the roles were switched with anybody on that patrol, they would have done the exact same thing. The medevac birds finally came. I remember telling them, I was like, hey, like, Kane needs to go. He's in trouble. There's six Americans killed and the rest wounded. So we had 100% casualties. My best friend that day was on the patrol, Corporal Sean Longevin. We did everything together. Sean was killed that day. Kane Schilling had a bracelet I wear on my wrist and made for us. He wears the same one and it's got all their names of the guys who were killed that day. I'm gonna keep trying to make a life that any one of these guys would be proud of. I took, you know, my lunch hour receptionist at the White House, you know, she says, hold for the President of the United States. I talked to him, it was a casual conversation, but it gets your adrenaline going. <laughs> my fiance went with me into the Oval Office. He's a funny guy and he's very easy to talk to. Just seeing like all the old buddies together after six years and some change, you know, kind of all hanging out again. Kane Schilling was there. Going to his wedding next year, he's coming to mine. So we both think of each other's family now. And it's good to have something so terrible, you know, there's a positive out of it. The hardest part about the Medal of Honor is, is wearing it. It's an honor to do because I know what it means. But every time I look at it, I just see their faces. I wear it for them because they're not here today and I am. And I just hope that by wearing the medal, I'm able to somehow honor their sacrifice. Their names won't be forgotten. <laughs>